sorry sorry this is just amherst media again are we are there going to be mics so that we can hear the board members yes okay great sorry thank you amherst media what do you see um all i see is the planning board members um in the town hall room i know that you guys typically present um like you have you know like planning board stuff that you typically share your screen um that's the only way we'd be able to see okay well as long as you can see the planning board members um because all we're seeing here in this room is a purple screen oh no on my on my um on the pc i can see amherst media is in the house and i can see the board members so, um so why don't we go ahead with the way yep, it's we're going to go ahead. The public can watch us in the room. Uh, we can obviously hear ourselves and we can be heard by the public. Right. And, okay. And we all, I think, have the handouts that we were going to look at this afternoon. That's this correct. Evening. So we don't mm -hmm. need to broadcast on the screen. Okay. Um, if you're able to bring them up on your screen so that Amherst the can documents, see them. I'm not sure. I, that seems to be what the problem was when okay. I was trying to do that. Right. Okay. But they have all been posted on as the that is correct. night so people could actually go there and bring that up. That is correct. Okay. All right. Good. So we're good to go. You are. Okay. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 29th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.09 p.m. This planning board meeting is being held in the town room at the Amherst Town Hall. However, this is a hybrid meeting. Members of the planning board and members of the public, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, may access this meeting via Zoom. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting. Or you can go to the planning board's webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which has the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please be aware that the in-person meeting will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual meeting, unless otherwise required by law. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, please answer affirmatively whether you are, well, please answer affirmatively. I will state for the record that all the town, all the board members are present in the room. Bruce Colden, he has answered affirmatively. Fred Hartwell, yes. Jesse Major, I, Doug Marshall, I'm present. Janet McGowan, Johanna Newman, Aaron Winter. All right. Uh, in case they were not audible in the recording, all the members answered affirmatively. For those participating remotely, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Planning board members who are present in the town room should raise their hands when they wish to speak and the microphone will be passed to you. We have two microphones this evening, one at either end of the table. Uh, I don't think the one on the other end is turned on yet, but we, it can be when we are ready to use it. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting if deemed appropriate by the chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited or raise your hand if you are present in the town room. 
If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on the phone. When, when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with the guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So, and having read these prepared remarks, I do want to say that uh, it's unclear to me whether, Pam, you will be able to see raises, raised hands. I should be able You to should see. be able to see those, yeah. those hands. Okay. So, um, oh, well, we now can see the Zoom screen on the screen here in the room. So yep. uh, maybe even I can see those raised hands, assuming I'm able to look up and notice them. Okay, good. So those comments are actually applicable this evening. All right, first item on the agenda, and it is now 6.14, uh, are, is the, the general public comment period. So this is for comments from the public on items not on tonight's agenda. So not related to University Drive and a potential housing overlay or related to uh, rather generic comment uh, agenda items of rental housing issues and general housing. Uh, we have four members of the public that I can see, Janet Keller, Jennifer Taub, Louise C, and Pam Rooney. So uh, any members of the public in, want to make a comment at this time? There are no members of the public in the room with us. Okay, I don't see any hands raised on the Zoom screen by the members of the public who are uh, watching on Zoom. So we will conclude that there are no public comments this evening. So time now is 6.15 and we'll go on to item two on the agenda. University Drive, potential housing overlay zone presentation and discussion about concept for an overlay zoning district to allow more housing with a mix of apartment buildings and mixed use buildings, including ideas for streetscape design. All right, so um, why don't we let the staff start the conversation? Uh, Bruce, you have your hand raised and it sounds like, looks like you would like to start with a comment. Can you get the micro microphone? Just to we received uh, we received minutes from uh, September twenty seventh, uh, uh, an earlier one of these meetings, which actually which I'm even though I wasn't there, I found extremely helpful. Um, are we not uh, expecting to approve those minutes? I don't believe we were expecting to approve those minutes this evening. Chris, uh, what was your intent? The intent was not to approve those minutes because we didn't want to spend that time tonight, but we will have an opportunity to review them on December 6th, our next meeting. Okay, and we'll hope so, to have so in, in fact, next week, next, next week uh, we will officially discuss them. But I'm glad you were able to send those out, and it sounds like Bruce at least found them to be very helpful. <laughs> yes, a uh, lengthy set of minutes for... Uh, Oh, I guess as long as we're, th I'm thinking about the length of the meetings, uh, since we're in person and we've started at six, we typically do that to try to let our staff get home and have dinner sooner than if, than, than, a, than meetings that start later. So uh, I guess my hope is that we can make this about a two hour meeting and uh, we've gotten off to a fairly fast start. Maybe talk about University Drive for about an hour now and then uh, leave us half an hour or a little bit more or less for uh, the discussion of the rental housing issues. All right, so Chris, uh, would you like to introduce the materials that were prepared for this meeting? Yes, thank you. I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director, and I have Nate Malloy, uh, Planner, and we are going to sort of tag team on this. We have a number of things that we've prepared for you, all of which are available in the packets that are online, even though we're not, for some reason, able to show them tonight on the screen. But they are online for anybody who wants to look at them under the uh, 
planning board page um, and there is a packet on the planning board page which people can access and maybe Pam is going to do wizardry now and be able to show it but I'm not sure if that will happen anyway among the things that we had were a map showing a potential area of um, an overlay district along University Drive and it includes both sides of University Drive between Amity Street and Route 9 and it goes roughly one um, one property deep each side. It also includes a property on the north side of Amity Street, which I think is owned by Jones Properties, and it includes Hawkins Meadow and um, Spilute Motors on the south side, and a little piece of the PR, uh, PRP district. Um, so I think all of the planning board members have access to that map and also the members of the public via the planning board packet. Oh, Pam has worked a miracle and has been able to show these documents. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> um, the second thing that we want to draw your attention to is a, what is this, a three-page document that um, describes um, what this overlay zoning district might be and asks us some questions that we would like some um, guidance on tonight about what the planning board thinks about these things. We also have some images of... Um, buildings that are similar to what might be built in this area. These images are all from New England, as far as I know, and so we can look at those later. We also have a document um, that we prepared back in 2021 that had to do with uh, a BL overlay district that was being proposed for um, downtown Amherst, and that was a, in, I guess it was an incipient zoning amendment, but it never really got to um, to be proposed, but it has a lot in it that we might want to borrow from for this overlay zone. And then let's see, the last thing I think we have, well, we have two more things. One is a document that Janet McGowan put together. It's called Possible Amherst Housing Solutions. And um, Janet has gone through and listened to all of the planning board meetings where uh, the planning board discussed housing and she wrote down all of the different ideas that people had. And I think it's a very useful document because it's really, um, it's quite complete. It's got pretty much everything. And then the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to were some um, items that Bruce Coldham emailed us about. He wasn't able to attend a site visit today and I'll describe the site visit, but um, he did send some questions. So we might be able to direct our attention to those items. Um, I'll just give a small, short rendition of a site visit that we held today. Um, Janet McGowan and Karen Winter and I drove around in my car, and it was really quite enlightening, even though I have been up and down University Drive many, many times, but to see it and really think about what was there, um, all the, the shops, um, there really are very few residential dwellings there, except for the Arbors and um, a development that Harry Roberts built recently at 70 University, but otherwise it's mostly businesses. Um, most of the buildings are one story. Uh, there are a, little, a few two-story buildings on the side where um, the hangar is. Um, <clears throat> there are two, there were three marijuana establishments there. I think there's one that is actually operating now. Um, and it's really kind of a, you know, I would say somewhat of a mishmash of different things, lots of parking, uh, wetland fingers coming in between properties. Um, I, do, do either Janet or Karen, would you recognize them to Certainly. elaborate on, on that site visit? Yeah, we, and it, I was surprising to me to see that there were really empty buildings that were there and so much parking that we had no idea was there, so much paved over um, uh, land. Um, it's definitely a mishmash, as you said. Um, on the parking front, I was surprised, like a lot of those little buildings have parking in the front and a lot of parking behind. So it's the lots are much bigger in terms of impermeable surface than I knew. 
So just to add to that, um, in addition, we drove to some of the peripheral areas, like we drove through Hawkins Meadow, which is an apartment complex south of Route 9. We drove through Greenleaves, which is an, uh, a condominium development that is in a PRP district south of Route 9. We drove through Charles Lane, which is off Amity Street. It's a little uh, single family development. And we also drove through Amity Place. So we got a sense of all the, the surrounding uh, residential areas. So it was really a good um, reminder of what's there. So, and we had a, a good conversation about what we were seeing. So that's a uh, site visit report. Now we, and we drove through UMass, through the portion of UMass that was um, listed in the U3 report as a potential area of development. And that is an area that's now parking, parking lots across from Southwest dorms, across uh, University Drive. So we looked at that. And then we drove up, um, what is it, Massachusetts Avenue, and we drove by the new building that's currently being finished. So I think that's the end of the report. But then I wanted to say that Bruce Coldham had some questions and comments that he has made about um, that area, which he wanted to add to the site visit report. And with Mr. Marshall's sure, sure, Bruce. permission, either Bruce or go I go through those? read those. Do you want to read them, Bruce? Yes, it was because I couldn't go. I, I decided not to go this morning and risk uh, compromising my ability to be here tonight, I guess. Didn't know how I would be feeling. So I, in the past, I, in, in the recent weeks, I had spent some time driving up and down there um, and, uh, you know, on the side roads and looking in, probably much as you did, and then looking at the parcel maps and seeing who owns them and, and how they are linked and all this sort of stuff. And, and, the, and, and the observations that I made were that there weren't any uh, empty lots awaiting development and uh, that there were seven lots along the north and western side of the University Drive starting from the Slobody parcels, but not including them because I thought they were three stories, they had an elevator. This I was trying to establish what I thought just rudimentarily were candidates for redevelopment and, and other places which were probably not so um, uh, immediately obvious because of the level of development that was there. So I, I thought that there was the seven lots along the north and western side of the University Drive seemed to me, from, in that kind of analysis, to be the uh, the, uh, the low-hanging fruit, not that it's hanging necessarily hugely low because it includes in charter and places that are quite new, but still only single story. Um, that there was a, um, that there was little likelihood of, uh, um, I can't remember what number three was. It's a, you, it, I interpreted it as uh, that there was little likelihood that there, that the changing oh, the zoning would actually spur development, which I think we could argue about. Yes, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think I thought that uh, places like the Victory and, and the new development that Barry Roberts has put in, and then the Arbors and the Health Center at the other end on the on the east side, there was really only that uh, 100 University Drive, which is a two-story building, which I think. I was probably partly involved in designing 40 years ago. Um, uh, seemed to, it was probably a two-story commercial, and I thought anybody who put an elevator in a building is probably is to diminish the likelihood that they would tear it down and rebuild. But that was just my, as I said, my thought as I, as I observed. Um, and then I looked at north of University Drive, and I had this crazy idea that uh, although the university owns uh, or in control of uh, parcels along uh, both sides, and particularly the east side of that. It's a narrow strip of control that the university, and it's backed up by some extremely long lots that come down from Sunset. And um, because of the way I created the co-housing community in North Amherst by excruciating uh, acquisitions and re rearrangements and partitions of lots and things, I thought mm -hmm. something like that is possible to do. It's not usually done, but theoretically it was possible to create something on that side of the road with unusual cooperation and initiative between uh, uh, multiple parties. So, well, this was just my observation of looking at the parcel site. So uh, my site visit was a little different from yours in that I was doing it uh, 
um, using the bottlenecks and things like that. And it just seemed to me, it's always seemed to me that the Try to speak that into the, the microphone. Uh, you're just talking really soft, and I don't know whether your oh, voice really? will be caught in the recording. Sounds like I'm bellowing. Oh, I know what the problem is. That's good. Um, that's the problem. Um, it seemed to me that the 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 real potential for development was also along the north side uh, on, uh, of University Drive, owned by the university. And I was interested to read that U3 Advisors uh, report that came around. Um, unfortunately, that seemed to be focused on the uh, parcel, the parking area that's now got uh, fairly heavy investment of uh, PV canopies on it. But the, uh, the the east side of the drive, without knowing anything much about the wetland positions, although imagining that there's probably something problematic in that regard, but that the uh, that the fact that there are so many, well, there are a number of very long parcels coming down from sunset that theoretically could be truncated um, with the cooperation of all of the landowners, of course, but they wouldn't be reducing their parcels to non-conforming lots. Um, and I don't know how deep down they care about their uh, their parcels towards University Drive, that the back ends of those parcels could theoretically be uh, sheared off and coupled with the uh, land owned by the university. And if the wetland permit situation wasn't compromising, that theoretically there could be uh, um, quite an attractive uh, and useful housing development along that stretch of University Drive as well. So that was my uh, um, my side visit. All right, thanks, Bruce. So I mentioned when you were or interjected when you were talking about your observations that you. I wasn't. I, I would. I'm not sure that there are, or I think that there are some parcels where you could do some development that are south of Amity Street, um, the corner lot where the the pot shop is, right at the corner of Amity Street and University Drive. Um, the you know the Slobody Building is pretty far back from the road. And we were talking last time about the fact that, that the property line is right at the sort of eastern edge of that uh, secondary drive. Um, so there's a fair amount of distance in there. Um, even where the Big Y Mall is, if you put a building right along University Drive, there's plenty of room before you get back to the, the Big Y Mall. Um, and then the the two story 100 university drive that is on the east side and you mentioned is also set back pretty far so um and by and chris you didn't mention that there is 70 university drive that exists also which is at least four stories right is it three it's three stories okay so that's a that's a multi-story relatively new residence building um, that's larger in scale than most of everything along that stretch, except for the Slobody building. Um, so those those were the parcels that that I thought, you know, I've I've seen in other cities where there was a deep parcel that maybe had a mall behind it, where the developer came and built a new building right along the street to try to make, you know, new urbanist housing or uh, development, and then. You know whether the the original mall stayed or was eventually torn down. You know it it depends. But uh, so, you know I think there's some. I personally think there's some potential. Um, even if, you know, this isn't maybe the most fruitful place to rezone in town. It's not bad to give a little bit more opportunity for something to happen, even. You know, and we can hope, but obviously we're not the ones building. Um, my only other comment would be that along uh, north of Amity Street, where the university does own both sides, when I've ridden my bike along that bike path, uh, it looks really wet along the east side as you go back, you know, 
even like 30 feet, it, it's, it's, it's pretty wet. And I'd be awfully surprised if there wasn't a lot of uh, interest from the Conservation Commission in leaving that alone. <laughs> but uh, who knows? <laughs> but um, in general, I, I think we should be talking about land that UMass doesn't own so that we can actually influence what we can influence. <laughs> okay, next, anybody else? Chris, um, I see Karen, I see your hand, You'll, you will be next. Um, I did wanna ask, Chris, were you hoping that we could go through this concept ideas document and kind of you know, get to each section and give you uh, feedback on what you've written or the questions you've asked? Okay, she says yes. So Karen, go ahead. Okay, just briefly, um, when we were driving along, I know Chris mentioned uh, Big Y, you could put another story on there. I think if we loosened some of the uh, regulations and as you said, there's, there's so much impervious parking there, you never see it filled up. There could be something along the road there uh, which could be attract much more attractive and unify the streetscape in a way a little bit like these pictures that we have here. So I'm very excited about potential in this area. Good. So you're also reminding me on Route 9, where Home Depot is, for years, there wasn't anything between Route 9 and Home Depot. And, you know, they came in the last few years and built that strip in front that has the jeweler and a couple of uh, restaurants in it. I forget, and maybe there's that men's clothing store or something. But anyway, what's that? Hot table. Okay, I haven't been there. But uh, anyway, so so that's another instance. It may not be exactly what we have in mind, but you know, at least there's a developer or an owner who recognized the parking wasn't being used, and I could build some more rentable space. Um, Chris, so would you like? Uh, me to moderate this, or do you want to go through and read, or you know, going through this this uh, document you put together? Where's the microphone? I was going to suggest that Nate could take over now and talk about what do we need to decide because okay. he was the one who really came up with this concept about we right. need to decide these things before we can move on, so we know what kind of dimensions we're talking about, what kinds of buildings we're talking about, etc. Okay. I think then uh, Janet had a comment that she wanted to make before, before we get to Nate. So um, when I reading the U3 report um, and then driving today, it you know, I when I was doing this work originally, I was kept on thinking University Village. You know, I'm, I'm calling it in my mind. And then I realized after reading the U3 report, this has already been thought about. And, and there were proposals by UMass to build along University Drive. Um, and I do think there are wetlands issues in this whole section, I mean, like the whole road, you know, you could just see little, you know, when you look at the maps, you can see the little wetlands plants and stuff like that. And I know Barry Roberts had to deal with that at 70 University Drive. And so to me, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this discussion here, but I think we need to step back and think of this in a more cohesive way. And also what Karen has been saying and what they said in the U3 report is that we need to work town gown. Um, we need to work with UMass on University Village as it could extend up. The, the university has tons of land up there, parking lots, um, you know, kind of grassy verges that don't do anything. And so I think, you know, if we're interested in getting them to build more beds and they have a report recommending places for beds as well as other places on campus, we, we should build on what has been done and keep moving forward that way. Um, and if we, you know, I'm interested in looking at this section of University Drive, but to me, it has to be part of a bigger effort working with UMass and students and everybody to kind of like, what's the vision? What's the village look like? And then establish that and then work to the zoning that would fit that. Um, you know, like the zoning here, everything is three stories right now. So it's not an issue. It's probably lot coverage. It's more of an issue. Um, and then what can be built in, a, you know, four different zoning districts. But I think that we need to step back and think of this in a bigger way and work with the partners who are right next door, you know, who could solve the problems or they've already, I mean, this report already covered all this ground, but anyway, I thought it was very interesting and exciting. 
All right. Thank you, Nate. Sure. Thanks. I, you know, on the um, the the handout, um, you know, housing overlay zoning district concept ideas. Um, you know, there's a question posed. You know, what should be decided first? And so, you know, establishing the district uh, purpose and goals, the geographic area, and then definitions, and then you know, the rest of the document is really, you know, standards and conditions or things that would already support, you know, going getting into the details of formulating an overlay. But I think at the last time we talked about this, you know, there was an agreement about what actually would happen on the University Drive if it was an overlay district. Is it student only housing? Is it um, a mix of apartments and mixed use buildings? Is it social dormitories? And so I think, you know, what Janet just asked is, is important, but it's also like, okay, would we allow a lot of students to live here through the market forces or would we try to change how what we want to see here? Do we allow townhouses? And I think you know, what are we trying to solve with this overlay? Is it more housing in general? Is it for a specific population? And so um, I think those are the questions we should be asking. So really, what are the purpose and goals? And we can, you know, I, I think there wasn't agreement uh, yet. And so I think that's really important because it could, you know, having that would could help shape really what, what we're thinking about here. Um, Chris? I just also wanted to say that it takes UMass a really long time to do anything and to make any decisions. So I don't think we need to wait or should wait for UMass to make decisions. We can certainly work with them, let them know what we're doing and encourage them to do things on their property. But if we wait, it's gonna take 10 years for them to do something and we don't have that much time. So I just wanted to say that, thank you. Okay, all right. Well, in response, Nate, to your 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 opening question, I guess my personal vote would be that it, it's open to anybody that wants to live there. Uh, students, uh, young professionals, uh, seniors who want to be close to the healthcare that's right around the corner or near the bus lines, everybody. Um, so I would be, I would support general housing um, of whatever persuasion that was built. Um, you know, if people are concerned that this would these would just become more dormitories and think that this is a bad place for that, you know, I might uh, be open to talking about uh, the allowable unit sizes and whether, you know, maybe two bedrooms is the maximum um, to try to keep it to smaller family groups uh, in this type of housing uh, and no four four bedroom units, uh, which seem to be the predominant unit type that caters to the student market. Anybody else have any thoughts about that? Janet. Um, so uh, just to frame it, I'm not really thinking of this as an overlay district, just like the concept, like this area. I don't know if it's a you know a zoning district or whatever, but just for um, I think we should play it out looking at it the way you're looking at it or suggesting, but what if this was just a student village too? Because like, that's the problem that people have is, and it's in the U3 report, it's in you know the Indy, it's in every neighbor that comes to talk to us is there's too much student housing in kind of residential neighborhoods and it's not a good mix. And so what if we predominantly put students in here and it could be up to a thousand students or a thousand beds you know, what if UMass built 2,000 beds, you know, all of a sudden that would just change our market. And so I'm not saying, let's say, just student housing, but let's think of that as a possibility. Like, what if this was a student village? And maybe looking at some examples of other universities that have built that and what worked and what didn't. Because I know, um, is it Boulder is doing one? And there's, so that crazy British guy, you know? <laughs> You know, so we've been listening to examples of other places. So if it was just a student village, let's think about that. And then keep your idea in mind of just, oh, maybe it's mixed for everybody because we do need stuff for staff and kind of working places. Well, I mean, we do have people in town who are strong advocates for more affordable housing, you know, and which typically doesn't go to students. So, you know, if we built a thousand beds in this neighborhood, a whole, you know, we'd have, I don't know, what is it, a hundred or something affordable units that we don't have now, and isn't that a good thing? But if we limit it to students, we don't do that. So, you know, I think there's there's competing interests. And yeah, so, no, I agree. I, but I'm just so. saying is, like, let's play out that scenario, too, because that could be where that student demand gets put in a way that doesn't have impacts. You know, there's almost mm -hmm. nobody living around there. Okay. Bruce. 
I saw your hand next. Um, my uh, thoughts a couple of weeks ago were that uh, focusing and restricting or uh, 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 toward the student housing uh, uh, exclusivity was a good idea because that seemed to be the problem we were addressing in town. Um, but then I read the uh, conversation of, of September 27th today, and I saw that this had been thrashed out somewhere. And um, I mean, not thrashed out. It had begun to be opened up. And I wasn't here, so I didn't know that until I read. And I think I would be uh, more inclined to say, well, if what I just said is true, if there is a strong demand for student housing in town, uh, and we did, as you suggest, Doug, and make this a more general uh, zone, then the market would uh, theoretically move towards concentrating on answering that problem. But uh, we don't necessarily have to uh, have a heavy hand in this. So I'm, uh, I'm moving to supporting the um, proposition that uh, you articulated. OK. Uh, Johanna. Thanks, Doug. I think we've talked a lot, and maybe we'll get to it more when we talk about other housing issues, but I feel like we just have a shortage of supply. And the more that we can just address that supply shortage with maximum flexibility, um, the more we can, yeah, let the market kind of fill in. And the more restrictions we put on it, the more we limit that ability. So that makes me think, open it up to all types of residents. There will probably be some students that live there. There will probably be graduate students and young faculty that move there. I think about Amity Place and the number of um, young faculty or graduate students like starting out in Amherst who live at Amity Place as like the first spot they go to. I think there's a niche for that. And by making it general residence, we would make sure that the inclusionary and affordable housing you know, requirements are there, which I think is a deeply held value in town and a housing type that we really need. So my inclination is also to have it be more general and not restricted to just students. Hey, Jesse. Thanks. Um, my thoughts are not to necessarily try and be restrictive, only students, allow the developers to do what they think they'll rent, which will probably be mostly students, frankly. Um, and I'll repeat what I said, I think it was at that last meeting. I feel very strongly that the commercial stuff that's there now, at least on the east end, sorry, south end, south end, is, is really essential for all of us too as town members. And so I'd want to do whatever we can to encourage whatever new development keeps what's there and grows what's there from the commercial So mixed use. Office. Mixed use, and again, I don't know what the tools are to make that happen or encourage that to happen, but I think it'd be a shame if it ended up just housing, because then I might not want to go there because it's too much of a hassle and there's not enough draw. And so I think we should keep that in mind as well. And I've also felt like the, the health, the health uh, functions that are there are valuable to, to keep. Um, Janet. So, um, you know, I, I, I have, you know, mixed feelings. I think that gets me back to the village, village center planning kind of idea and your idea earlier about having some green space or playgrounds for kids that, you know, there's some amenities there for families. Um, you know, even if it's student housing only, you still, the inclusionary zoning requirement applies to it and you're supposed to spread the affordable units throughout the building, which I don't think is a real treat for those families or the, you know, and so we were talking about that problem at um, Aspen Heights, is it, or Chase or whatever, that the affordable units are, it's a student housing development and they're spread around and it's not that, it's really a conflict of kind of lifestyles to put it mildly. So maybe I was saying, what about if, you know, they, you could build a separate building or a section off the family area um, and maybe change the bylaw to let that happen. So if it was like 100 units and 10 were affordable, maybe those 10 units are grouped on the same floor. So if it's families and 
non-students that they could kind of have a more um, early to bed. Kind so of they could be first floor units that have a yard behind them. Yeah. And every, all the other people, whoever those are, people are upstairs. When you characterized Aspen Heights as a student, comp a student complex, was it designed for students and it was the developer pretty upfront about that or was it designed it, as it, market rate apartments that are open to anyone? Uh, Chris. It was initially proposed as a student housing development, but the town doesn't like student housing developments except in those few areas where we allow the social dormitories. So the town and the ZBA pushed the developer to develop it as a family general, everybody can live here. And then this, the families were invited as part of the affordable housing. But we're saying now, maybe that's not the best model. It doesn't always work. And we may need to think of a different model. But Nate could help us figure out how to do that, because there may be state laws about not segregating certain types of people. In other words, uh -huh. can you segregate the families from the students in an affordable in a development that has affordable housing? The state may have regulations about that. So, okay. And, yeah. um, Nate, do you want to comment about that? I see a couple other hands. Yeah, I, I think that um, you know I think Aspen Heights is one example. We don't have too many others actually yet where there's a lot of units that are mostly students, and then there's you know the 10, 10 or twelve percent that are affordable, which are which are not students. And so I think eleven to thirteen East Pleasant will be one where they have um, you know they'll have a fair number of affordable units, and we'll see what that's like in a year or two. But I, yeah, my thought is if the market does what the market does, and most of these are student rentals and we have our affordable units, I'd rather see a larger percentage of affordable units, you know, or a higher percent AMI. So right now we have 12% and, you know, under 80% area median income. You know, I've, I've been saying, well, what if we had an additional percentage up to 20%, so 12, 13 to 20% of the units would be up to 150% AMI. So then we're trying to get to the missing middle and, you know, it wouldn't be capital A affordable. It'd be a local restriction uh, I mean, the state would probably allow it, but it would be something that the town would monitor, uh, be more work, you know, for the town. But it's, you know, I, I feel like there's a balance at which, you know, students and non-students can can live together. And I don't know if the, you know, when it's 90-10, I don't think that's a good balance. And so I don't know what the market will do. So if we do allow density here and a new building goes in, will it be 90-10? You know, whatever our, our inclusionary zoning requires, or would a developer do something different just because they also want to have a mix of, of residents. And so, you know, I'm a little torn too, like how heavy handed are we here? You know, do we have a little bit more regulation in terms of affordability or income or, um, you know, like the Doug was saying, you know, could we say that 10%, if you have an apartment building of over 50 units, 10% have to be three bedrooms or none can be four bedrooms. I mean, I, could we do that? Zoning typically doesn't get into the interior of a building I think it can get into proportionality of bedroom of unit sizes, but not getting really specific. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, to me, that's kind of, it goes back to the purpose though. So in goals, is this, anyone can live here, let's make it open in general market, but then how do we try to influence or try to get a mix of of residents, right? A diversity of, of residents, as opposed to right now, it seems like it would just be mostly students. And so I, I think there's tools, I think we'd have to investigate it a little bit. So Aspen Heights, there's, like, there's like five Aspen, thank you, sorry, Matt, Doug. <laughs> I saw your eyes. Um, so is built by a, a national developer of student housing and they run a van to UMass and to the, to the um, Hadley stores pretty often. And so that's their market. If you go on their website, it's student, student, student. And so we have met, Amherst has met, it's like housing production targets, and almost all of it went to students, right? And so that's who's building um, all the major developers that we're seeing are often national developers of student housing because they see high turnover and high rents. Um, and so we should assume if we build a thousand you know, beds, probably most of them will go to students, or we could say 50% of this building has to be non-student. Non and that would create some space for, you know, it may, no one may want to come build here because if you can charge two thousand dollars for per month for three hundred and fifty square feet, I don't think you're going to be. That's not family housing, and that you're never going to see 
you're not going to see families, but you're going. You, will you see the developers coming in, getting less per square foot for for housing? So. Okay. No. Uh, Jesse, I saw your hand a while ago. Go ahead. I guess this was really a question. I think for Nate, who wrote the document with bullet points, one of them made me think inclusionary zoning was not necessarily required, or there were ways in this overlay to not have that. Is that correct? We're not correct. Yeah, I think um, depending on how we structure the overlay, it, it doesn't have to apply. So right now, you know, it applies to most residential use types. It doesn't apply to, you know, the social dormitories, for instance. So what was built up on University or on Olympia Drive doesn't need to have inclusionary um, units. But in the if this were an overlay, we could say that, um, you know, we're coming up with a new apartment definition and inclusionary zoning doesn't apply to that. So. Um, you know, I think we'd have to be careful because we do have the uses already established in the bylaw. So what we haven't done is said, you know, we're coming up with a new, anything new yet, but it could it could be the case that we could do that. Could, could we, in, within this zoning, within this overlay, allow social dormitories without requiring affordable housing percentages and mixed use buildings that are market driven and open to anyone that would would be required to have those affordable percentages? You could. So in the overlay, right, we could take the existing residential use types we have and say whether or not they're allowed. So maybe the social dormitory is allowed by special permit in the overlay, but other ones are by site plan review. And is that enough of incentive that the mixed use buildings are built and not you know all social dormitories? And it could be that you know, if we did that and we the first two projects or three are just the social dormitories and we say, okay, we don't like where it's going, you know, do we change that? Uh, you know, the difficulty would be, do those then become some, you know, non-conforming or what happens with how they're, um, you know, what's the zoning after that? But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, it's one of those things like how, you know, I think some developers might come in, the national chains might say, this is great. Or if we have, you know, certain requirements that, you know, limit size and height, maybe local developers will still be interested in this. You know, it won't be opening it up to like landmark to come back again. Uh, you know, it'll be like, okay, I'll, I'll do a 50 unit building. It's not a 500 unit building, it's 50 units. What's there now is, you know, one story, you know, commercial building, but they're willing to put in a mixed use building. I, you know, it's hard to say exactly, um, you know, who would be the ones who to develop this? You know, we're, we're offering that an opportunity with an overlay. We don't actually know who would come in and take advantage of it. Well, having asked that question, the, the social dormitories typically don't have any commercial space in them. And that would, that would be a problem for me uh, in terms of what I'm interested in. Because, you know, when I looked at your photos of the different examples, you know, I. I really uh, respond positively to the buildings that have pretty transparent first floors that are offices and commercial. So um, I, I would have a hard time figuring out, you know, do we need a social dormitory type that still requires commercial on the first floor or, or non-residential use of some sort? Um, and is that, you know, are we creating a new hybrid monster that, you know, I mean, that we don't have yet? Um, so, Johanna, I think you were next. She's had her hand up a little while, probably before yours. So, Bruce, you're after that. I just still come back to the primary thing of we just need to produce more housing. And once we produce more housing, we'll see where the market settles out. But, you know, so much of the pressure on the neighborhoods is that the students need to live somewhere. And by creating just more opportunities, I think that's like a critical step that's going to move us in the right direction. Okay. Bruce. Um, a couple of comments, if I may, uh, just to clarify. By social dormitories, we mean more or less what uh, we've approved for uh, Olympia Drive? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Doug. I, I think there's a strong, uh, we should hold strong to the notion of uh, mixed use uh, uh, of the first floor, uh, the, the, the ground floor, at least in the, the street front, uh, be uh, 
encouraged to support the kind of commercial activity, commercial retail activity that would be uh, um, support the kind of uh, activity, the residential activities that, that we're hoping to uh, there. And 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 following that a little, um, I uh, um, what I want to ask myself, and therefore I guess the process is, if we are upzoning this, I think it uh, we're, it is an upzoning thing. I think we're talking about so we're adding value, potential value to these parcels, and depending on a number of things, particularly story heights, whether it's four or five, um, I guess that value could be more or more. And therefore we ask ourselves, I think, um, what can we get the development enterprises to kick back into this process? Um, and I, I, am, I was wondering whether part of that whether some formulation could be constructed that would um, avoid what's happened with the carriage houses where basically all of the small-scale commercial enterprises were essentially uh, spread hither and yon and they either went away or they, they ceased to exist. Um, so uh, question number one for me then would be, is there a way in which some kind of... Um, uh, agreed rental relief, I don't know what the right phrase is, but I imagine the phrase is very important because you otherwise stumble over some legal obstacle that you didn't intend to. But in in simple terms, whether there would be some kind of uh, rental relief that could be, or incentive that could be imp uh, uh, maintained for a certain number of years on these commercial spaces that would allow um, some enterprise allow a, a larger variety of enterprises to uh, get a footing, get a foothold, and 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 stay there. Um, I say that partly because I think I understand that the uh, that the the commercial space the commercial space is the uh, is the, is the lesser important uh, revenue generator, and if that's the case, this should be possible. So that's, without going into it any further, that's a question that's in my mind. Um, and thirdly, uh, following on the exchange that you and Nate just had, it seemed to me that it would be useful in terms of height to look at the kind of construction that's possible. I think I, I, I it's a long time since I've had my head in the building code, but um, I kind of imagine that there's a certain uh, maybe five stories allows us to have a, a, a concrete slab with a different type of construction on the first floor and you can have a less expensive frame construction above and maybe that can be four stories if it's sprinkled and three if it's not. And so maybe there's some magic about five and maybe you guys already I, know this. I think there is. There I think that's exactly what you've described, um, that if the first floor is essentially non-combustible and separated from... The upper floor, you can build a four-story stick-framed building on top of the first floor. So we 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 uh, I think it all has to be sprinkled in in you know anything and over our, 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 five thousand square feet. Our height limit then is cognizant of that, and it uh, it's as high as it can go, and maintain the uh, maintain the capability of of uh, local enterprises to do the work as opposed to having to get Suffolk from Boston or something like that. So I think that would be important too as we think through how we establish the height. But it sounds like this has already been done and we just don't forget it. Um, Karen, your hand was up for a while. You were next and then I think yeah. Janet. Thanks. Uh, I, I was really um, surprised to, to learn about this study that was done in 2014. One of the issues, and I and I thought it was kind of amazing that for the sixty thousand dollars that was paid, so much was uh, was learned. They focus on where development should go. One thing that they brought up is a question whether if we're going to have a lot of commercial spaces uh, developed in University Drive, is that going to compete with downtown, and is it going to? And that's something we should think about. 
but otherwise I like Bruce's idea that you give the developer enough, and, and I think Nate has brought this up too, enough leeway that they can earn uh, the profit that they need to on the residential, uh, starting with the second floor, and then maybe have subsidized or just have the possibility that they really get small businesses that need low rent uh, in the first floor and that this is done for a number of years because otherwise it's true we'll have these we we won't have any possibilities of these shops like for example i miss uh being able to buy sheet music somewhere there are so many things that i miss in the carrot shop the, the knitting store how can we make it possible for us to have residential to provide a lot of room where students can be and still have shops of this kind at the bottom it's good thing to think about how we could do that on that on that subject um one east pleasant that's where protocol is right which was vacant for you know was it six was it i mean let's let's say it was a few years i'm not sure it was actually six but uh i guess to chris and nate you know i was surprised that they didn't lower the rent enough to get somebody in there sooner. And do you have any sense of what the perspective of the developer was, that it was worthwhile letting that be empty until protocol actually came to came to be? Chris, you, you're kind of nibbling on that. So this is totally my theory. But my theory is that those particular developers have a very high sense of their um, aesthetics and what they want to present on the ground floor is something that is representative of them and the building in general. And so having a sheet music store on the ground floor probably isn't the image that they're looking for. I have not heard this from them, but that's my idea of what is going on with them because you're right, they could have rented that space to someone for a lot less money and had a tenant but they chose not to, and they chose to wait until they had a tenant that they thought was commensurate with the their standards. grandeur or their standards or whatever. So I think that's part of what's going on, but I don't quote me. Okay, thanks. Janet? So I'd like to sing the praises of small kind of crummy shops, because I, you know, so, you know, I was just in Davis Square today, and I took some pictures I can send around of um, the main drag on Elm Street, and they're just these crummy commercial buildings from the 50s, maybe. And Pretty crummy commercial buildings. Yeah, and they're, every single shop has got a different storefront. They're all small. They're all full, almost all full. And, um, you know, the, from the burn to, you know, like Mike something or other. And, you know, so people like that kind of facade, like a small shop they can go in. And it's also easy to start up if the rent is low. And so, you know, it, it so... You know, and I, I, you know, with those shops that you were just describing in Hadley that just, you know, the Hot Pockets shop, it's just a, it's just the same kind of small strip. We have that down in Amherst, like we have two strips of small stores. People throng to that. And so I think when I was looking at these pictures, I was just thinking all that big glass, it's just so uninviting and the, it's so uniform looking. But I, I think the, you know, we could just require that the first floor has to be small shops or mixed size shops with different facades and different kind of window treatment. So it doesn't have this monotonous kind of I'm building university housing for students somewhere in America kind of look. Um, and we can give people an extra floor if they do that. Um, my concern, this, I'm sort of jumping ahead to the other things is I think if you say you don't have to do mixed use and you can just do apartments in as many units as you want, you're going to lose the commercial because everybody's want, going to build their, you know, two thousand, you know, dollar, you know, two thousand dollar a month, you know, studio to get maximum rent. So I think we should, if we're giving extra height, we could ask for what we want to see, and maybe someone leaves. I think they, I think one East Pleasant Street could afford to leave it empty because they were making so much money upstairs, you know. And I don't know if Protocol got a lower rent, but it obviously didn't hurt their profit line because they applied to build two more buildings like that. Okay, um, Johanna. I guess um, I'm looking at the clock and we have another 50 minutes and we've like 
touched on the first bullet point on this. So, um, or I guess we've touched on other aspects of it, but I wonder, you know, given that ideally staff comes out of this with some clear direction and action items, whether, I don't know, we should just like move through these bullet points m more quickly or, yeah. Were there aspects of the other bullet points you wanted to put in your two cents right off the bat? I can't tell if you're saying every single lot should have should be required mixed use or just the corner lots because in this kind of proposal we're saying it's kind of listed as corner lots so i'm curious to hear yeah thanks I, yeah i mean I, right now i'm still not sure that there's been a consensus on the purpose and goal of it and i think you know so I, i'd like to i just bring us all back i think the conversation's good it sounds like we would want the flexibility of different housing types, different buildings. Um, and so, I'm, you know, it's still, I, I still want to make sure we're understanding what that means. So we're, we're starting to get to it in terms of what are we allowing? So is it mixed use buildings everywhere? It sounds like we really wouldn't want social dormitories at all. Um, you know, and so if it is really a housing opportunity here, is it okay that most of it will be rentals? You know, do we want to have other types of um, unit mix or configuration. Uh, and then, um, you know, and then we start getting into things like what Janet was saying. For instance, if it's a mixed use building, would it be okay if it was a, there was a fifth floor, if it was stepped back from the front of the building? You know, you didn't say five, but that was, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, Cause right now we say we'd limit it to four. And so, you know, if we wanted to have um, cause it sounds like most, most of the residential subsidizes the commercial. So if we want more commercial space, you know, what is the right mix of residential to commercial to, to do that? Yeah. I mean, one is pleasant. I, I mean, I kind of agree with Chris. It's like, you know, was there a reason maybe they just, it was designed as a big space and maybe they just didn't want to carve it up because it, once you did that, you might not go back to getting another tenant that they were looking for. And so it was worth it to keep it vacant and keep marketing it to get the tenant they wanted. Then carving it up into five little shops. And so, um, you know, I know the way you can construct now, you can have big open spaces on the first floor. You know, I think that we could have design standards, for instance, to have small scale facades and treatments on the first floor. It doesn't mean that the interior space isn't gonna be one big space, but right, you know, breaking up the the that, but I think it's really hard to say that you have to have small shops, you know, small, gross floor area units, commercial units on the first floor. And so, you know, I don't know if there's a way to incentivize it. I think it's really difficult to do that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think I just want to go back to the purpose and goals and then I think the geographic area. So this, you know, the outline is the outline. Is it, you know, is it, is it, you know, it, it crosses a few different um, zoning districts. And so really I'm considering this as an overlay because to change all the base zoning would do um, could be could do more harm than good in terms of things becoming non-compliant or what happens there. And so really, it's an overlay that would be, you know, voluntarily used by someone. It wouldn't be, um, you know, the idea would be that if it's enough upzoning and there's incentives there, they would use it. It might, you know, if we don't strike it right, then it might never get used as an overlay. Um, and so, you know, I think the boundaries seem good to start. I mean, we ha there hasn't really been a discussion, you know, does it go south of Route 9? You know, it does include right now. Um, Hawkins Meadow, and it includes some properties coming up the hill um, east of the intersection of University Drive. And so, yeah, I think those are considerations still to discuss. Uh, uh, the only part of the outline that I wonder about is why it goes north of Amity Street. That one, that one property on the corner. I mean, I know it's a rental house, and it's, you know seems to periodically get sort of pulled up and then it slowly declines and gets looking seedier and seedier and then it gets pulled up. Um, but that's the one location where if we were to have a, you know, a pretty substantial building, seems like it would be kind of out of place. Janet. I, I kind of didn't understand why it jumped over um, Russell Street or Route 9. 
because it, then it took over um, Hawkins Meadow, but it left out like all the other apartment complexes right next to it. And then um, I thought it sort of took in a bunch of small residential houses off of Snell Street and Route 9. I just It just seemed very, I, I kind of thought, part of me just thought, let's just stay on this side of Route 9 so we can just focus on that. And then I thought if you're expanding it, leave out the small residential houses because we want to leave the neighborhood a little alone. And then why why not include green leaves? And I think there's another there's another housing complex next to Hawkins or the low income housing place. Um, there's Aspen Heights and then there's oh it has a new name. And then there's Vest Vesta. Oh, it's in Hadley. Okay, sorry. So I just I didn't know why it when it jumped over Route Nine, what it, why it included some things and not others, and then why would you include small houses, kind of thing. So, uh, Jesse, or unless Nate, do you want to respond to that? Sure. I mean, some of it is the you know um, we've often talked about how could you incentivize redeveloping existing apartment complexes, and so you know, including Hawkins Meadow. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but if if we have the right density mix, you know, could it? I mean, there's a lot of open space there. The site design may not be as you could, you know, you could have twice as many units and still have a nice site design, for instance. Um, you know, going up Route Nine into the area that's in purple, the few homes. I mean, those homes have been rented; they're old, but they're pretty beat. And then there's a geographic area. You know, what right? Where is the boundary? Where does it stop? But you know, the thinking would be there is that if you have a nice development, it's on the corner across the street from, a you know, one university drive south. And so, you know, across the street is the five college realtors building. It's like if all of a sudden you have a few nice buildings there in a streetscape, okay, there's an announcement, you're coming somewhere right now. I mean, when I, for years, I've driven home going by those homes that are rented and half the time there's seven cars parked in the front lawn. They, try, you know, cut across traffic to go the wrong way. And sure, at one point, they were probably worth saving, but I look at them now and I'm like, wow, I don't think they've have had investment in years in them. And they actually look really tired right now. Just this year, they seem like they've reached a point where, you know, whoever is owning them is just making the money, right? They're not investing in the upkeep of the buildings. And so I think the one that's right outside of it is actually a really nice brick building on Route 9. And then there's a larger lot with the Italianate house. And, you know, at some point it's like, oh, do we go there? And I'd say, you know, I, I feel like I'd want to keep it closer to university drive in the corner there, not extended. And so, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe that isn't the right boundary, but my thinking was include all four corners of that intersection uh, for some possibility. Yeah, that makes, makes a fair amount of sense to me. Uh, one other use that I hadn't thought of that just came to mind for this area would be a hotel, you know, a, a, a sort of an urban hotel that, it doesn't have a lot of parking associated with it, but you could, you know, come here, take the bus or take an Uber down to UMass and do your conference and then come back. Um, you know, if you want to stay in a hotel in Amherst, uh, other than the University Lodge, I don't know where you would stay. All the hotels are in Hadley. The Lord Jeff. Yes, of course. Excuse me. I hadn't, hadn't thought about the Lord Jeff. Yes. So, uh, Bruce. Uh, um, a moment ago, we were talking about um, uh, having housing going down uh, to the first floor and so forth. If I understood it correctly, I, I would uh, maintain that the entire streetscape or street front uh, in this zone or in, in this overlay should be dedicated for commercial retail which is not to say that the whole of the first floor should be i think there is considerable value probably in encouraging uh, 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 ground relay or ground connected housing um, on the backsides or courtyards or what have you so i think our um, the guidance that I would give in relation to that would be, yes, keep the mixed use and the commercial along the street front and uh, and maximize the uh, ground connected housing to the uh, to the rear side. 
I think that that's the that's the approach that I think would be the sweet spot for this, because it would therefore allow various types of housing that benefit from having ground connection. There wouldn't be a lot of it, but there'd be some of it, and that would add diversity and theoretically therefore stability to the whole uh, enterprise. Okay, great. Jesse, was your hand up for a minute? Just to back up, my very simple stab at the goals and purpose. Allow the market to build, parentheses, student housing, and require commercial, I think the whole way, I agree. Require, um, allow the market to build student housing, essentially, that's what they're going to choose, but also require the first floor mixed use. A geographical area, um, yeah, I think besides the one house on the north, it all makes sense to me. Janet? So I think we shouldn't jump over Route 9 because I think that I, I love the idea of redeveloping the apartment complexes for more density, but those complexes are places where like regular folk live, right? And so if you allow more density at Hawkins Meadow, you know, that's that's where people will swoop in and build a student housing. You know, so this this is a place where, you know, working people live. There's places all around South Amherst like that um, it, that are probably mixes of some students, mostly regular folk. But if you incentivize it for more de density and development without some kind of controls, it's just going to turn to th these. That place will just flip. I also think no one's going to be able to cross the street. And so we if we're building a a university village of some sort, we have to figure out how people get from one side of Route 9 to the other or cross over, you know. And so I think this is a really dangerous area and it's mostly the throughway into Amherst and towards the university. And so I would mm -hmm. I would just stay on this side of Route 9 for now. I'm sorry if these houses are tired, but I, I kind of think you're kind of rewarding people for letting, I mean, if you started to talk about, you know, houses that are declining in Amherst and not well-maintained, um, I think you could look at 200 and see that. And so I don't, I just don't think, you know, those those could be turned into like a nice Victorian or a triple decker or be a nice house. But I just sort of think we should stay in the core area and not kind of jump over. Okay, Johanna. Thank you. Going back to and building off the purpose and goals. So Jesse, I really like your two ideas of allow the market to build, notably student housing, and commercial ground floor. I do think another goal could be, and I'd be curious to hear what others think, is using this as an opportunity to address that missing middle piece. And so if we're saying it's market driven, but we're not gonna do social dormitories, is there more we could do like, you know, I don't know, saying from 13 to 20%, it'll be 150% AMI just to help make sure that we get affordable housing and you know, a notch above affordable housing here as well, and that that's another goal of this project. So that suggests it's not just student housing? Correct. Because if it was student housing, we'd just do social dormitories. OK. Well, then, so yeah. So I was, I was actually going to disagree with, or, or enlarge the vision that Jesse expressed with, you know, building student housing and having commercial area, I was going to say, let's just build more housing of whatever type the market decides to build with some commercial space on the first floor at the street edge. All right, so, oh, good. We've got all, everybody's hand up. Uh, so Bruce, and then Karen, and then Fred. And uh, so, uh, Jesse, could you hand the, over, to, over to Fred? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think I'm in agreement with you, Doug, uh, about uh, let's, uh, I, any uh, housing that's created here uh, is going to uh, positively affect the uh, market uh, elsewhere in Amherst. And I am intrigued by the uh, idea of a uh, a bedroom limitation. 
because I think that would uh, address the uh, some of the worst aspects of uh, that particular cohort. And I also uh, strongly support the concept of commercial on the first floor. Uh, I've said this before, uh, one of the real challenges to the town of Amherst financial picture is the uh, ridiculous percentage to which uh, the tax base is tilted toward residential. And that is not in the best interest of the, the town long term. So uh, this, uh, this does check a number of those boxes that what we've been talking about. I, uh, uh, I, I think it's an interesting idea to consider the extent to which Route 9 is going to end up as a, a barrier to uh, what we want. And uh, I, I've been in a couple of those uh, uh, particular occupancies, I'll call it, on uh, University Drive down near uh, uh, the Snell Street uh, intersection. Uh, <clears throat> One of which is uh, is in owned by a, a family that uh, I have a social relationship with, so that's why uh, slightly, and so I, I've actually been in some of those. But uh, yeah, uh, in in general, I I think this is a productive discussion. Thank you. Okay, Fred. So why don't we just go to Karen, and then we'll go to Bruce. Uh, I I want to uh, agree with Janet. I don't think we should need to go over Route Nine. I think we should make this a a kind of a concise area that we focus on, and really encourage building this up and getting a lot of dense housing, because in that particular area, you're not you're not infringing on neighbors that are very sensitive, except for the the little area with the small houses that we toured that we thought was so nice, that small sort of moderate income houses, the neighborhood behind, you know, um, on the, excuse me, Charles Lane. I think Charles Lane is, is really lovely and should be kind of protected. Um, it's important that, that these kinds of neighborhoods are, yeah, are protected. And the same thing with across from Route 9, looking at those condominiums that are place there because they, they're, they're so close to Route 9, but they still have enough land around them. They're peaceful. Um, you know, going to other university towns, you have often, I've just been to Berkeley, you have these dense areas, but then you have asides of them, places where people can go walk and breathe and that are, that are open. So I'm for uh, reducing the size, not going across the Route 9 at the moment, and really driving ahead this area that we're talking about to try to get dense housing in there, let that be market driven, which means it's gonna be, you know, well, we'll see what happens. And that will, and, and the purpose when you go to goals, our goal is to save also to save the town, to save neighborhoods from the intrusion of um, too much student housing need which is just eating away and eroding the other residential areas. So we have to kind of get going and, and have an area that's going to do, except we need something like 10,000 more beds. And I don't know how much this area can supply. So the need is gonna be ongoing, I suppose. All right, Bruce. Um, I'd like to go to the top bullet point on the third page. Um, which says buildings would be allowed to be up to four stories high, and then it continues a bit. Um, uh, I'm thinking that if we can uh, get five stories here, that would be a good thing. And I know that uh, story height has been an issue with new development in town recently, but that's been in the center of town. And this is not the center of town. This is almost the reverse of that. It's a a new and an upscale, I mean, fairly wide 
the streets and it, it seems to be exactly appropriate to have the buildings there as tall as we possibly can and additionally because it i hope would serve the uh the, the, by adding that additional value allow us to extract the kind of uh perhaps rental incentive benefit for some years that would stabilize the commercial sl slice of this so i think it seems to me that uh going up that extra story to five would be appropriate and beneficial um to, th to this enterprise okay thank you i'll just say that i i agree and my my poster child for that is one university drive which is a three-story looks like it's been chopped off proportionally it's really awkwardly low uh it's the new barry roberts building with the eye doctor in it um you know there's probably there probably could have been another 40 units in there with hey maybe they were for would have been 40 students who would not be in 10 more houses in town and i don't i mean there i didn't wasn't here in the planning board for any of the history of that built building I, I have heard I think a rumor uh, you know for me it was just sort of anecdotal that it came in originally as taller and was was chopped down which you know just looks to me like a mistake uh Chris Chris you you probably know the background of that but I I completely agree with the five stories down here it was proposed to be higher I think it was proposed to be four stories high and I believe that the reason it wasn't is because of parking because they didn't have enough room on site to park enough cars to accommodate that building. And they made a deal with the town to use some of the town right of way to accommodate some of their parking, but they were just really pushed to the limit as far as parking. So I think that that was one of the major reasons why they chopped that top floor off. Okay, thank you. Well, we haven't talked about parking at all. Um, you know, obviously parking reduces the amount of land to uh, to build on. So my inclination from the, at the beginning at least, would be to have fairly small parking requirements for this area, you know, which would let the developer say, you know, I think I'm going to target this at people who are going to use the public transit and ride to, ride their bike to UMass and walk to Big Y or no, I want to have more parking and I'm going to have build less and, you know, I'll reduce the footprint of my building. So I would, that's where I would start. Karen, and then Fred. I definitely agree. I think we should reduce the parking requirement. We want less, we want more green space. We want more houses. We want people, we want to encourage public transportation as much as possible. I really do think that's an important part. Okay, Fred, and then Johanna. Yeah, I, I would also agree, and I'd also uh, a, a major expense in this kind of construction is the elevator. And once you, you know, once you've got an elevator shaft, uh, you better use one it. way to mitigate that is another story. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, there's a, a market incentive for that if if that fifth story is available, and I think it ought to be. Okay, Johanna. Thanks. Um, I also think five stories is appropriate. I also think little to no parking requirements will help us generate more housing and, you know, get people using public transit and the bike path. All of this connects beautifully to the bike path. And I want to talk a little bit more about geography because I think by crossing Route 9, and including the intersection, you just create a more dynamic space than if you exclude it. It's like, you know, you're in kind of narrow sprawl and then you have this, I just, I think it, I think it's the opening. I think it's the keystone. And I think it'd be a shame to leave it out, both because by land mass, it's, you know, 20% of what we're looking at right now. And that to me feels like a missed opportunity. And I think there's just, I think it is part of making this really a vibrant entryway into that new neighborhood that we're creating from Route 9. 
Okay. Um, Janet. So I was staring at the um, nursing facility and the um, the OP buildings, and I'm wondering about unintended consequences. So if you have very tall buildings that could be packed with apartments, you know, and are people, are the owners going to want to flip those buildings and turn them into housing? Do we lose that, those facilities? I, I especially think you would probably lose Hawkins Meadow, but so, um, and then, you know, so I, I just wonder, like, if you increase the density, what could you lose that you want to keep? And think about that. And then also, I, I do think of University Drive as ex I'm, I'm still not abandoning UMass and their 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 ideas. And so, I think this is a great place for students. You know, it's they're going to want to live there. It's right next to UMass. That's why they crowd the neighborhoods. You know, downtown. And so, I think you know, just good spot. But I do think Hawkins Meadow. Let's leave it for another day. You know, I just don't think it's going to become this dynamic area of people racing across from nine to, you know, the um. You know, things. So, I mean, everybody gets in their car and drives across because it's so dangerous. But I just don't think we should disturb that community right now. It's pretty stable. Okay. Um, anybody else, or should we? Have we given you enough to get a little bit farther by the next time we have this conversation, Nate? Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I drew Jana when you were speaking earlier that yeah, maybe Hawkins Meadow and the other area could be excluded, but I do like including the other corner. Um, you know, all four corners on University Drive and Route 9 in the overlay. And, and, and maybe that shifts a little bit, but I like the idea of having, you know, the opportunity to, to mirror development across the street. I actually think if we have more people there, then there's a solution to solve the, you know, the crossing problem and the traffic problem. So I think that's coming. I think um, I think that would happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've given us enough to staff to think about. Um, you know, to me, the height is an issue, and it's something that you know the downtown design standards were hopefully going to have a consultant selected pretty soon, and that's something I want them to look at because you know we have, you know, for instance, in this overlay, would we require flat roof buildings? Right now, we don't um, include certain things in the height of a building. If it's a pitched roof, it's to the midpoint of the roof, not to the to the to the peak, and so um, you know, equipment on it isn't considered part of the height, and so essentially, everyone. Um, you know, puts all their HVAC up there and everything else, and then they put a basically a you know six foot or eight foot vinyl fence on top, and that adds to the height. And so, you know, when we had the height in the in the document, you know, that was an absolute height, and we said there's no footnote, so there's no way to waive it. And so, you know, for me, it'd be you know what what is the right height here, and how to, and in the overlay we could define it differently, or we could have standards and conditions that really would say that you know rooftop equipment can't be visible, and you know maybe they, we require a parapet or, you know, we could really push on a developer, even with a peaked roof, you can design trusses so that there's a saddle or something, or there's pockets where you can put things. And so we haven't been great about that. You know, I think 133 Southeast street is an example where they put the fence on the top, you know, the new building down in um, East Amherst, and then they, you know, put the mini splits on there. And it's all you could see was 50 mini splits, you know, behind the fence. And then they added some screening, but to me, um, the absolute, the relative height of that building is really tall. And you could actually have a five-story building with a flat roof that is probably shorter than what that, that building is, even though it's not five stories. And so anyways, it's just something to consider to me. It's like, okay, five stories, but if you're doing 15 feet on the first floor and you're going to do 10 feet on the upper floors and you put HVAC on the top, all of a sudden you're at like 70 feet or something. And it's, you know, it's just, it's, you know, I, I think in this overlay, we have the ability to say we're not following the existing dimensional standards, we're coming up with our own. So what is that? You know, we're saying a certain setback on the west side doesn't have to be the same on the east side of University Drive. We're saying, you know, maybe we're not gonna have a big parking ratio. We're gonna be flexible on lot coverage and building coverage, but you know, we're, so those are the things that we, you know, staff would start looking at, like what is the right dimensional standards and uh, conditions for this? I guess my, my comment in response to that would be, you know, let's try to use what we have as much as we can in our, I mean, I just, it seems like it might lead to a great deal more complexity of our zoning code in a way that just might just generally be uh, unwieldy, I guess I'll say. Um, 
I mean, personally, uh, the five stories is fine with me. Um, I don't object to it downtown. I don't object to the mechanical units on the top. I know, you know, I'm not one of the people that is vocally opposed to those buildings. So I know I there's people disagree with me. Um, if we allow five stories, I think we should allow a hi the height that those buildings have actually ended up being because I think we had a, a, like a 51 or two foot maximum and then we give a variance for an additional three feet or something in order to let them accomplish five stories. And uh, so let's make it 55 feet or whatever those buildings needed for, for five stories, let's actually put that number in so we can get rid of that one variance. Uh, Janet. Why don't we just fix it in the zoning bylaw that the definition of the height and the parapet? We could just, if that's, you know, if that's, you know, that problem has come up over and over. So why don't we just do an amendment so we just say the height is your height. And if you want to stick all your stuff on the roof, then you're, you know, I mean, you don't need a 15 foot first story, you don't need a 12 foot story. So I'm just wondering if what's bothering you might be just the way the bylaw is right now. So. Yeah, I actually, I, I will wait to have the consultant for the downtown design standards. I think that's something that we've asked them to look at. And I think it's bigger than just, oh, let's have a number or define it. I think there's a lot of variables in terms of how the buildings are built. I think for the overlay, though, we can have dimensional standards that are specific only to the overlay and standards and conditions that apply here. And maybe they get extrapolated and incorporated into the zoning bylaw. But, you know, by the end of the year, we hope to have a consultant on under contract for the downtown design standards. And I'd really like the consultants to use, you know, their knowledge and professionalism and best practices to define the height. So I don't, I'm so, not, I don't necessarily have the right answer. I think if we said an absolute height is always this and nothing can be above it, you know, that could be really problematic in terms of equipment or design or, you know, anything like what does solar mean up there? And so I'm not, I think it actually it gets a lot more complicated and a lot more variables than just assigning a number. I agree with, with what Doug says, though. I really do think that it's if we're thinking we want it to be five stories, you know, we can talk to developers, we can look, look at it. Is it 15 feet, 10, 10, 10? Is it 15, 10, you know, 15, 12, 12 for upper floors and actually have what is the right height, not something that is actually too short that we have to have a waiver for every time. Um, but I, But in terms of what we're deciding now, uh, Jenna, I don't, I don't really want to get into like what is the definition of height. That's something we, I'd love to the consultant to do because I, you know, I, I just think that it gets more complicated with whatever could be on the roof and how we define it. Um, and even looking at these old pictures up there, you know, looking at the what well, used to be here, it's like, you know, is, you know, is having a spire on the corner of a building is that part of the height, you know? And I just, I don't want to start trying to define that now well the mansard which i'm seeing i gather at least my the apocryphal maybe it's apocryphal but the mansard originated in paris when the height limit was to the cornice so they built to the cornice and then they created the mansard that where you could get an extra floor as considered that part of the roof anyway so uh what's that Mr. Mansard, yes, during the Napoleonic with Mr. Hausman. Um, so it's 20 of eight, and it feels like this is a good spot to stop this part of the agenda this evening. Um, and if everybody looks like they're okay with that. So time is 741, and we will go on to uh, the other housing issues conversation. Uh, part three of our agenda, which had two subheadings, rental housing issues and general housing issues. And Jesse, I'm I'm wondering whether I could call on you. Uh, you had requested that we add this to the agenda and I wondered if, if you could give us kind of what, uh, what you were thinking of when you asked for this. Thanks. Sure, um, I just wanted to continue the conversation we had started I don't remember when it was, when uh, we had, before we had UMass reps here, we started talking about ways, basically what Janet, Janet summarized, right? The discussion about all the different ways we can start to think about um, addressing the student rental density in neighborhoods. 
Um, and so I've been working or trying to put together a bunch of numbers of what we have, because maybe it's because I'm a scientist, until I see the actual, some of the data, I can't really think about how to come up with changes that would be meaningful and useful. Um, and so I actually I have a handout for everyone, if that's permissible, we can post it later. Um, and this is some stuff I assembled just from the town JS with a lot of help and probably too many e emails to Nate asking for how to get different things. So maybe I can pass that around and we can okay. get starting point sure. in the conversation. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Nate, looks looks like you'd like to. Yeah, I mean, I think that this conversation is, um, you know, the RKG, uh, the consultants who wrote the housing comprehensive housing uh, study said that, you know, it's going to take multiple approaches to get, you know, the desired outcome. And so to me, this is kind of the, you know, the, the other side of the coin. If we're allowing density here, you know, are there other things we could also be thinking about? And so um, you know, that's all I was going to say is just that I think that they can happen in parallel, that I think they're, they're really uh, kind of complementary discussions. Yeah, and just to add to that, the way I think about it, the getting new building is great, but that's not going to be soon. And so maybe there are steps we can take that would be sooner than that as a planning board, as I do think that's part of what we can do. Um, so anyway, just to explain what I'm putting in front of you, um, the neighborhood is the same data, just organized differently. On the left side is alphabetic order with these neighborhood codes, which came from the property cards. The right side is just sorted by the percent column. And so again, this is straight off the town GIS. Total number of properties down at the bottom, you can see 7,137. Well, there are a couple hundred that didn't have all the data, so I couldn't do it. And then this rental column is again from the property card and it's simply listed as owner, owner occupied or owner unoccupied. And so I've just tabulated the number of owner unoccupied so by each neighborhood. The first one on the left, Amos Woods. Yes. There are 489 units. Properties. Properties, and of those 69 are Correct. rental? Correct. Not owner occupied? It just says owner unoccupied. Okay, and and the 14% the is 69 divided by 489. Correct, the percent owner unoccupied. Right, okay. It's listed as owner unoccupied is right. what it says. So, so it's, it's the percentage that, that are, that the are percentage probably rentals. rentals. Right. Now, a big caveat here is that it's not parsed by student versus non-student. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's just the numbers. And so, again, I just need to see what we're talking about. And it's the and same information on the left and the correct, right, just, just ordered, ordered differently. differently. Correct. Okay. Um, and... What I, my first thought was to try and see this in relation to UMass sort of radiating out. And I think we'd all guess the same thing, that it would be denser near UMass and moving away. And it, I think it's pretty much true. I don't so think on, the, on the right, the way you've ordered it, it probably pretty roughly, pretty consistently correct. corresponds to the top being very close to UMass and the bottom being furthest from UMass. Correct. Okay. And it kind of holds true if you look at the rough neighborhoods. Um, something in, part of the reason I wanted to look at it this way was if we're gonna think about ways to influence where or how far apart or how many student rentals there are, I'm not sure I can think about it as a town-wide regulation or change or whatever we're gonna make because the neighborhoods are so different. We can't say, oh, the, the whole town, we can only have uh, 30% rentals, because that's not going to help the neighborhoods that are already at 50%, because that's where more are going to keep happening, because there are other neighborhoods where there's only 14%. So, so in my mind, we might have to address this problem more local, in neighborhoods if we can. Um, so I just wanted to share that with mm -hmm. the board members and, and get input on if there's other ways that it would be useful to look at this kind of data. Well, so given the sort of geographic correspondence, I mean, it seems like an obvious takeaway is if you, if you accept, I guess, if you accept that the preponderance of rentals are students, that this supports the idea that students really want to live near campus. Right. And, and that they're much less interested in living in South Amherst or further away. 
And so that the demand for student rentals probably corresponds also to proximity to UMass. Yeah, I think that's that's a one takeaway, certainly. <clears throat> uh, Janet, uh, would you like to? East Amherst might be an anomaly because there's a lot of um, kind of cheaper housing there. There are student housing, but there's a lot of low income housing and more to come. So that is going to be a high rental neighborhood, but not necessarily student based. Just... What are what are these? I mean, the like Amherst Woods, Amity Place. Those are single developments, and and like, what are those? From, how did you even aggregate that? Yeah, the, yeah. So the um, uh, as Jesse mentioned, this is from the property card. So this is assessors data. We've also provided the um, last year's rental registration, which is the most complete, uh, and so. I think you know the next step I was telling Jesse is I can I can map this and I think you know I've been talking to the IT department of creating a kind of a, a you know a, a geo database with all this information that then can be mapped and we can display it by attribute and so these these are neighborhood codes on the property card from the assessor's office and so uh, you know and it might have to do more with how they um, you know the valuation of homes not necessarily you know how is it in a cohesive neighborhood so I I want to map it. I can map it pretty easily and then see, okay, you know, what is Central Amherst really? Uh, what is Echo Hill or Echo Hill condos, which are probably could be, you know, aggregated together. And so, um, but so really these are just neighborhood codes that the assessors have on the property okay. cards. All right. Yeah. And it's, I mean, one, w one thing that I had thought about prior to this meeting that I thought I might ask for you to in your GIS folks to do was just, you know how how we have these maps of the of the base showing every 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 part or every every property. Could we just get a plot of the town with any property that's listed as not owner occupied in red and everything else is green or whatever, just so that we could see is it is it you know sort of at this point probably to confirm what Jesse's what your information already suggests that. Most of the rentals are right around UMass. Yeah, I think the um, I spoke with the assessor, and she said that this information is probably you know seventy to eighty percent accurate. In part because, you know, it they look at it only when say when legally there is a change. If it's a change of ownership, if there is a declaration of homestead, if there's certain things happening that they can see at the registry, or through taxes or other legal means, uh, and they really try to update it now pretty regularly whenever that happens. Historically, it may not have been updated. Um, as systematically. And then there's the rental registration program, which is kind of an honor system, right? You're supposed to self-report that you're renting. And it's actually been pretty good. And so the next step is to kind of cross-reference the rental registration data with this data, and then it could be mapped. I think the difficulty is uh, historically it was never, that these databases never spoke to each other very well. You have to link them somehow and then the way to then show it all is through GIS, right, through a mapping software. And so I think we're getting to a point where we can start to do that. But, you know, three years ago, even, all we could ever see were tables like this. And so, okay. uh, uh, but I, I agree that I think we could get to a point where we could um, even have a map that shows, you know, this compared to the rental registration data. And you could see where the overlap is or where there's inconsistencies. Okay, Jesse? And, and then just, and then Chris. Just add, add a couple other points of what we're looking at. Um, one that's really important is the rental registration. So I did get that list from you guys, which was great. But if you can see the third line at the top of the asterisk, um, the rental registration from this year only had 1,211 properties total. But from the property cards, there were 2,026. So there's a big chunk missing from the registration, I guess, is, is one takeaway, not for us, but for, for that process, right? Um, even if it's only 80% accurate, that's still 600 places that are not reporting um, or not being reached somehow. Um, the, the other thing I was hoping to discuss, if others find it useful, is how we can start to capture student versus non-student, because as part of our discussion that's already happened, it's been a really important part of this issue if we want to limit student houses and allow other non-student rentals, which I think we all agree is part of the problem, this middle rental that's missing, um, one way to do it is to 
define the student rental and then somehow limit the student rental. But we don't, until we know what's what, it imp feels impossible to do that. So I have some ideas, um, but I'm open to others. I was wondering if we could make, or if anyone else is interested in helping me do this, a subcommittee to figure out how to capture that data um, just on student versus non-student rentals. Well, I know when UMass was, the, the reps from UMass were here, it sounded like they had better information on on where the students are living off campus. So, you know, it could be that, I mean, Chris, I don't know whether it would be, you would have an avenue to request, you know, that kind of, the addresses. I mean, obviously we wouldn't want to have the names of the students, that's probably private of who's living where, but, but what addresses are students living at uh, off campus? Um, and that would be a way to start to get at it because it, you know, it seems like there's a fairly consistent year to year con continuity between if it's a student rental, it stays a student rental. Uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to comment about that topic because, you know, at our last meeting, we had UMass in here and, uh, I we we got the uh, historical data from from them about uh, the uh, number of students and so forth that were housed versus not housed and so forth and uh, I I never would have thought this uh, but I I I brought that home and I showed it to my wife and my wife uh, at con a considerable period of time as an adjunct professor in the psychology department. And she looked at the, the uh, virtual student, the online, because UMass was saying, you know, this is now an important part of their enrollment. And they, they weren't part of the local rental housing picture. And my wife said, they're all living here. And I said, what? And she said, yeah. They're all, I can, I can tell you, uh, because I know where, I know how many of my students were uh, coming in electronically, and I know where they were living. They're all living in Amherst. They just decided they didn't want to actually uh, uh, come to classes. And I, wow, <laughs> I never thought about that. But, you know, I, I think we need to, you know, to ask UMass to take another look at uh, what the what that number what that number means what they kind of implied that it meant because that was astonishing to me so uh, I, I just you raised that issue so I yeah okay uh, I think it's time to mention that thank you okay well thanks for that bit of information I guess um Chris, should I let you jump in? I know Bruce was the next hand that I saw. I just have a simple question. What does C slash I mean? Uh, Nate says he doesn't figure it's that out. a location uh, that Jesse? I'm familiar with. Looking at the addresses, because I have all the data. Also, it's the neighborhood behind the high school. It looks like. I don't know what CI is either, but I think those are the addresses. No. No. Um, No, more south. Not south of the high school, but but I guess east from the high school, but but yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yes, yes. Well, that's what I think. That's what the C slash I is on here. It's the yeah, and and again, I I couldn't map all this easily, so I couldn't piece it all together. That's what I was hoping would happen next. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess we'll hopefully find out more next next month. Come on back. <laughs> uh, Janet, uh, oh, oh, yeah, Bruce was next. Bruce, did you turn off the mic? Did it die? Uh, then I'll pass this down here.
Well, my comment's not as interesting as yours, Fred, uh, but I was also drawn to this uh, chart that we got last time. Just, um, Jesse, your total here is 707,137. Uh, I don't know how thorough that is. That's probably not the grand total, but since we have the num number there, and I look across and uh, the, uh, the number of off-campus undergrads from this chart was 8,183. So, but many of those are in neighboring towns. We, and, and that's a number we don't yet really know, I think. It was one of the questions I was asking, can we identify what fraction of the non-housed students, non-UMass housed students are looking for housing in town? Um, your data suggests that closer is better and Amherst is closer than Sunderland. And so, I mean, I don't know what the assumption would be, but if it's two thirds, um, then, uh, and this, I'm not including grad students here because the general sense, I think, from that discussion was that there wasn't a big difference between graduate students and <laughs> regular residents. <laughs> I don't know how you say that. So let's go with the 8,000. So uh, it gives us a sense of how well beginning to give us a sense of how well the town is coping, what the pressure on, uh, but if your number is low and it should be eight and eight is half and so, it indicates, you know, it seems anyway to indicate that around half at least of the rental um, opportunity in town is being taken, uh, well, actually, I guess we, it's, it's being taken by student rentals. I mean, I'm, I'm making that broad uh, conclusion, a uh, tentative conclusion from based on what I'm looking at these two incomplete uh, charts. So we can we can we can refine that as we go ahead. But that that's beginning to help me more as I look at this stuff. Thanks. I actually think it's higher than that based on just the number of owner unoccupied. I th I think UMass uh, the people that came said that the um, students want not no longer and more and more to live centrally so the pressure on downtown amherst is getting greater and greater um and i think what this what you're what you seem to be headed toward is that we might have to put in some um regulations in certain parts that are extremely targeted and that are extremely vulnerable that we sort of circle those parts i think that's where this is going right Yes, yeah. Thank you, Doug. Yes, that was my thought. And again, going back to what I said earlier, maybe I didn't say it very clearly. To just somehow regulate the whole town wouldn't change the density in certain neighborhoods. Because if it's a percentage, if it's unless it's a, a distance model, but a lot of ways you could choose to regulate if it's the whole town, because of an unequal distribution, it wouldn't help those very high density areas wouldn't change really anything to me. And it sounds like if we wanted to authorize more social dormitories in town or social, whatever we called them, student-only housing, it's better to do it near UMass. It's more likely to be that a developer would think it was worthwhile investing to build such a thing because that's where the demand was. Um, Jesse? OK. Um, thank you. Um, so I would, in the data front, um, page five of the U3 report, they, the census in 2010 said there were um, 9,711 housing units. And so that doesn't even include all the the new housing. So I'm just wondering, these numbers, I'm sort of, anyway, so I was going to read the page 29 of the report and says, finally, Amherst already has a powerful tool in place with its rental unit registration program. Continuing to build the program's ability to track data and enforce the code will further protect neighborhoods from an infiltration of student housing. This can include requiring property owners to de denote if tenants are students or moderate, low, or very low income. The registration program can also target recently converted homes from single family to student use to enforce overcrowding, creating a disincentive for prospective developers to purchase other single family homes 
and convert them if they know their income stream will be reduced through enforcement. And so I know we're looking at the rental registration program, but just if you, maybe we could require saying, who's your tenant this year? And, you know, every landlord will know, you know, if their tenants are students, well, they're, where they're they work. They're likely to know who at least one of their tenants is. Right? I, 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 mean, they're, they're, I mean, trust me, if you have student tenants, you have every name on, on your lease because you don't want to, and you might even have their parents as, co you know, so it, okay. you're going to know how many people are in your building or should. All right, Karen, I see you, but I see Nate, and I'm wondering, I'm going to give Nate. Sure, I was just going to say that the, the information here is, um, you know, it's hard to compare. Right now, this is looking at properties. It's not looking at number of units. And so the rental registration uh, typically, we've only had one rental permit for what could be multiple units on a property. And so it's sometimes it's hard to have that comparison because, um, you know, even like a, our building permits, the town typically has issued one building permit for what could be, say, like one East Pleasant that has 100 units or whatever it is. And so uh, getting down to that granular level of, of data can be tricky because it's not something that we've historically recorded on permits or on property cards. And so the rental registration um, system now uh, does list number of units. And so then, you know, it, it's just taking the, you have to, you know, kind of drill down a little bit more and then just figure out how you're comparing it. And so the census, right, lists um, number of year round housing units. And so there's like, um, uh, according to the 2020 census, you know, there's 10,660 year round housing units in town. Believe it or not, there's like 30 that are considered seasonal. And then, um, but the, the way a student can claim to be a resident when they take the census, you know, is different. So um, in the 2020 census, it actually looks like our population changed or between 2010 and 2020, it dipped because of the way students declared where they lived when they were taking the census. And so I think it, the census sometimes is a is a is a really kind of um, approximate tool. I, I feel like I would I'd want to use the UMass data and then ask them a little bit more about it. And that, to me, that would be the most accurate information in terms of where students live and how we, you know, for um, well, how we categorize them. Go ahead, Janet. So they would say one East Pleasant Pleasant Street is one rental unit, and so with that knowing there's like a hundred apartment. One, one rental property. One property, but knowing there's a hundred units in that, would that increase, change the percentages in this chart or no? You're back to the property. This is just okay. um, what percentage of properties are rental. It's not talking about units Number at of all. apartments, okay. Okay, Jesse, you wanna say something else? Thanks, Doug. Um, yes. Uh, Again, backing up something said earlier, I'm happy to keep working on this. And I'm trying to figure out the best way to really visualize the numbers also. Again, I'm not sure that for our discussions, these this many neighborhoods is the right way. If others have ideas, please, is, you know, is, this is a starting point. Is this list of neighborhood, is every place in Amherst part of one of I, these neighborhoods? I believe so. Uh, sorry, that 200 number down on the bottom here, mm -hmm. where it says missing 200. So first, this was just exporting all the property cards. All but about 200 had a neighborhood associated, had okay. one of these codes. So it's the majority. So by and large, every property is part of one of these neighborhoods? Correct. Okay. Um, but again, I don't know where these all lay out. I'm guessing there's different neighborhoods that might make more sense to define for this discussion. But I definitely need help deciding what that could or should be. Okay. Karen. So I know personally living in this densely populated area, uh, you, this this four unrelated people is not worked. It, it's not enforced. I know personally from the inspections have to be announced when they come, the students move out, they move their mattresses down the street. Everybody can see that. The inspector comes in, comes out, the mattresses go back in. Talk to Marilyn Smith who lives right down there and close to the university. So it seems like that solution is not working. I don't know how you could get it to work. I think one thing we should really zero in on, and I think Ithaca has certain plans, but in these areas which are so vulnerable next to the university where you have historic houses you want to try to 
preserve neighborhoods, I think you might really have to have a distance between student house so that you have some houses that tough luck they can't, you know, they, if they haven't got students living there now, that's not gonna be an option. And those houses maybe then won't be able to be snapped up by the kinds of investors who are now uh, coming in. Okay. Um, Johanna, I, I actually saw your, her hand before you, Fred, so you're next. Um, first of all, thanks for compiling this, Jesse. It's really interesting to think about and look at. Um, I'm thinking about the neighborhoods where maybe there's fewer rentals, but it's like it's popping up, right? Like it's happening. I think like I used to live on Columbia Drive and I feel like Columbia Drive is off of East Hadley Road. So it's across the street. It's a neighborhood across the street from the boulders and kind of butts up against the Bramble Hill Farm conservation area. So it's, you know, it feels like a Echo Hillish kind of like moderate family. We were subletting from a, you know, family that was abroad for a year when we first moved there. And it was like watching dominoes fall, you know, watching the single family homes be converted to student rentals. And I imagine similar dynamics are, you know, at play in Orchard Valley right now. And some of those farther, like farther out areas. And one question I have is how can we nip it in the bud? So I'm interested in the, like I hear you on the, okay, the neighborhoods in downtown that already are like kind of feeling a crush of student, but I also feel like there's the the emerging issues in some of the farther out neighborhoods. Fred. Well, this is where I put in the plug for owner occupancy. Um, and the, uh, you know, owner occupied, uh, student housing uh, where the, there's an adult uh, on premise uh, are they're not the problem they the the, uh, the noise complaints they don't come from owner occupied and uh, you know if you're going to create distances between student houses and so forth you've got to give a buy to uh, owner occupied because they're just they're simply not the problem. Okay, thanks, Fred. So it's 10 after eight. Jesse, I'm just thinking we should wrap up soon. Yep, just, just one, two last thoughts. When I look, when I've been thinking about this, obviously, quite a bit, and looking up the different strategies, I think the, the distancing one is the only one that gets at all the neighborhoods in the right way, I think. Meaning where it's not yet very dense, whatever distance requirement you set can prevent the dominoes, right? Um, but what's required to do that, I think also for our town and based on some of the other conversation is the determination of student definition of a student rental versus not. Because I think we all want to encourage also the non-student rentals to be very present everywhere. And so I, I think, I don't know how I don't know if that's the first step. As a town, we need to somehow define what a student rental is, and then that can get reported on the rental registration in order for it to then progress and be part of the distancing plan. Um, yeah. So I, one of the issues with a distancing issue plan is something is how you impose it on a non-compliant neighborhood. You know how how do you tell some landlords, you know, your neighbor got in line before you by three minutes. So you and your next two guys down the line are not uh, able to rent to students anymore or at all. I mean, maybe. And so, you know, there's the grandfathering. It will, would, would it actually, would it actually change anything in the in the neighbors neighborhoods that are dense it, maybe it would only impact the neighborhoods that are slowly transitioning 
uh, before before you know things are in place. So I don't remember. I don't know whether Bruce or Janet were next, but Bruce, uh, you're closer to Fred's microphone. So why don't you go? Um, I've been talking to a number of, uh, of planning directors uh, about the, this particular strategy. And so I think if, we, well, I'll simply say that if, if I think if we were proposing to go down that route, we really should uh, uh, talk to the two or three uh, communities um, uh, that, that, that have been doing that have been doing this for a while, and ones that have uh, reinforced it and ones that have backed off from it, because it's, uh, you've just begun to scratch the surface on that one. Doug. This is an enormous. Well, are you going to drive a whole lot of rentals underground? Right. I mean, I uh, possibly also. It's just the, uh, the 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 formula for imposing this. Because I think we first we would have to first of all understand that in doing this kind of thing, and this I have from the folks that have done it, is that you're creating a you're creating a market, or you're 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 creating market discrimination, and you first of all have to be able to sustain sustain that, you know, in a court of law. Uh, or think you can, and 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 then you have to be able to uh, convince the constituency here that uh, that it's a good idea because it's it's a very it's a very involved uh, process. So, well, of the of the research you've done, and you know you've you've been our our leader in that. Have there been approaches that you've gotten generally, you know, that seem really promising? Um, Doug, I haven't dug deep enough because uh, <laughs> what I've done is, 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 is tried to get a broad brush response from various communities about their approach and, and so forth. And so having done the, I don't know, 10,000 foot flyover or whatever you might call, you identify patches of interest and, and this is one patch of interest uh, and then you would fly lower and you would do that kind of work. So I don't think yet, certainly me, have, have I dug deep enough to really get a useful um, summary uh, of what the issues might be. But I got the impression that they're there. So either Chris or Janet, why don't one of you go next? I just wanted to say that <laughs> um, you need to think about manpower or women power or people power. And our inspection services department is already way overstretched in the work that they do, and they don't have time to do all the things that they should be doing now. So to add something like this would require adding staff. And we're already talking about adding staff because of the rental registration program, which is being um, updated and expanded. So we're trying to figure out how do we get enough inspectors who can handle that, which is something that a lot of people have already bought into. So I'm just bringing this up as a Gosh. Practical, practical thought. Caveat. That's right. Okay, Janet. And then so I, maybe we close. I agree with Bruce's. Like we have to look into that deeper. And one of the questions would be: Did you have to get more staff? Like, how did you enforce it and things like that? So, how did it work? Did it work? And how does it work? And did it require more staff? Would be a great question. But I think that I don't think you have to grandfather it in. Um, but somebody, you know, somebody gets a permit for students and someone doesn't, but that opens up units for people who can't find housing to rent in Amherst. Like many of my friends who, you know, they're older and they can't find housing or, or else it's really substandard and really expensive or in a student building. And we're trying to create a market that is more balanced. And so, you know, so you're saying, okay, you can't rent to students, you could rent to other people. That, you know, there's a lot of people who want to rent in Amherst, and there's a lot of staff that could find places. So I think you're playing with the market in a way, and I think I think we have to do that. Um, um, so. Okay. All right. Anything else? Anybody really needs to say tonight? Karen, and then Fred. So maybe one of the things we have to do is zero in on owner occupancy. <laughs> you can only buy a house and rent it out if you're going to live there. All right, Fred. Yeah, I just uh, at the last meeting I got into uh, 
the uh, subdividable dwelling. And because we were over the time limit, I didn't cover one topic. And I just want to take about two minutes to mention something that's really important about um, uh, the subdividable dwelling, and that is that that permitting is front end loaded. And I found that almost nobody's aware of this. I. Uh, what do you mean by that phrase? I, I'm going to get to that. Um, when you get a special permit for a subdividable dwelling, you get the special permit at the outset for the highest possible use. And uh, let's say uh, you uh, get the, the permit for that, you occupy the entire building for 10 years, uh, and then your children start to leave home, decide, yeah, okay, now I'm gonna rent a, a, a unit out. You don't have to get another special permit. The whole thing is front end loaded, that 10 years later, you go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, not at a public hearing, at a business meeting, and you say, this is my revised management plan. I'm, uh, do you have any, see anything I could do different? Okay, fine, 10 minutes, you're out of there, and you get your building permit. Uh, and the, because it's front end loaded, it can be taken into account at the time the house is mortgaged. It is, the, the bank is not, a bank will not give financing based on a future special permit because special permits are discretionary. In this case, they can give uh, financing based on the fact that it can be divided and become income producing in the future. And that is huge. And almost nobody understands it, but that is built into that part of the bylaw. I didn't get to that, I wanted to correct and, and add to that at this meeting, thank you. Okay, thank you, Fred. Okay. 19 minutes after eight. Did we cover housing rental, ho rental housing issues and enough general housing issues? All right, I think everybody's played out for tonight. If, unless anybody has anything else to say, uh, it looks like Chris does. Oh, is there a, I don't see any hands raised. Is anybody, any public members, Janet, Jennifer, or Pam, anything anybody wants to say up there for public comment? Doesn't look like it. Chris, uh, that was not giving you any noise. Hi. Um, so Hi. I just wanted to talk about how we're going to move forward with this topic. And I think um, rather than having, this would be our suggestion, our recommendation, rather than having an additional meeting every month that we try to incorporate this topic into our regular meetings. And um, so that's what we'd like to do when we see that, um, you know, a particular agenda is on the lighter side, that we would add this topic and then we would keep discussing it. Um, and those would be our usual Zoom meetings rather than in-person meetings. So I wanted to get a sense of whether that um, was acceptable to all of you. Jesse? Looking at some of the articles and history, I'm a little concerned that would be very slow. Um, <clears throat> I would be interested in figuring out how to work on this a little more rapidly. So I don't know if a subcommittee is the right way to go to then bring topics more specifically to the full board. Um, I, I don't know what the options are. But again, it sounds like this topic was raised 10 years ago, right? Or some number of years ago, and there were studies, and nothing's really progressed. So I'd love to figure out how we can try and either determine we can't do anything or determine we can do something a little more timely. Chris? Does that mean that we need to meet in person for an extra planning board meeting every month, or does that mean that we just well, I, I mean, why don't why don't we look at our agenda as you know, as you know it over the next yep. six weeks, let's say, mm -hmm. and see if there's some opportunities to kind of continue this conversation in at least 
the frequency that we've been having it now. Mm -hmm. So at least once a month, yep. they at least one of the two meetings each month, mm -hmm. can we devote a reasonable portion of the meeting to these kinds of conversations? So, you know, I mean, and, you know, there have been periods in my experience on this board where we were really full with a lot of applications and some of them were very complex, needed a lot of multiple meetings. We haven't been in that mode lately and maybe we're going to continue in this mode. So let's strike while the iron is high, high, hot and keep, 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 keep it moving. Um, you know, I'm eager to, to do something at University Drive and move over to East Amherst. Uh, you know, I mean, let's let's let some people build down here. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to say we're eager to do that, too. It puts a strain on the staff when we have three, three meetings, meetings a, month, a month and then we have to do minutes and yep. postings and all of those things and produce documents for three meetings a right. month. If we cut it back to two meetings and then right. um, slotted this topic, either University Drive or neighborhoods into those agendas, I think it would be more manageable for us. Right. Okay. Well, one question about that is, say we went to two meetings, mm -hmm. say we can continue to have these conversations in one of those two meetings each month. How do people feel about Zoom versus in person? If one of those two meetings, like the first meeting of each month was in person, and then the third week of each month, our second meeting was on Zoom. I mean, I think there's been some, I've, I've sensed some positive feedback to having us all in the room every now and then. So from a staff point of view, is that a lot more work or is it equal to a Zoom meeting? Chris? Yeah, let's get rid of that dead microphone. Yeah, for me, it's not a lot more work, but for Nate and Pam, I think it is a lot more work. Uh -huh. Yeah, because they have to actually be here rather they have than to be here. turn off their camera and eat their dinner at home or something. Uh, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, from a few standpoints, a Zoom, meter, Zoom meeting is a lot more efficient. So we've only had one or two members of the public come in person. They still attend through Zoom. We present our information over Zoom. No one really looks at the paper copies. I can annotate on a screen or do live edits on a map or in a Word document. And so... For me, if one of the regular meetings was in person, that would mean an applicant would either have to be in person and presenting, and then Amherst Media would have to pick up the presentation, or they would still be at home presenting remotely to us in person, which just seems kind of strange because really half the meeting tonight is really, or more than half, is still happening over Zoom. I think that, um, to me, it's like I think we can facilitate a discussion over Zoom as easily as around a table. We don't have to pass around microphones. Um, you know, and so I, I, to me, a Zoom meeting is can be just as personable and efficient as in person. Bruce, I think Jan, I think is that okay. Um, I, I share your sentiment, Doug, that uh, having had these meetings has been very good. But we have had now four or so, and and I feel that the connection connectivity between us now is really established quite nicely. For me, the difficulty of these meetings is it's hard to hear. Um, I really have a troubled time hearing you, Jesse, and others as well, and Chris, actually, because of where she was sitting relative to where I was sitting. When I'm on Zoom, I just put my headphones on, and I can hear more clearly. So Zoom gets my vote for that reason. Okay. So, well, why don't we then go to two meetings, you know, stop the third meeting each month, Let's see how the agenda uh, lays out over the next couple months and try just doing Zoom. You know, if we need to, you know, I'll come back to my house or I know go back to Janet's house for, for uh, you know, hot mulled wine and, uh, and, 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 and nuts or whatever it is people want to serve. Uh, we could have a non-business get together if we all need to see each other's face in person. Uh, Karen? Is, is it a possibility for some of us to just get together to discuss this, some subgroup like Jesse and I, whoever wants to meet for coffee 
can we do that and and see so my understanding problem? is uh if this body doesn't ask you to do that a it doesn't become open meeting law and then we governed and if you don't have a quorum so fewer than four right so three three or fewer three or, uh, three or oh, fewer can just thanks. on your own decide to get together okay thanks <laughs> Yes, Janet. Well, if, if they come up with something to that they want to present, uh, they could show up. I, I'm hoping. And then and at that point, one of you should email Chris. You can copy me or not, and request to put your conversation on the agenda. <laughs> so so I, I I like the idea of a housing subcommittee. Because you know Bruce is doing all this work as he can, but you know the question was, can somebody call UPenn or Penn State and talk, find out how their, you know, what does their minimum distance look like, and can you talk to the inspectional services department and find out how it worked and how many people it took? The housing subcommittee could answer those questions. You know, give us ta the the committee could give us tasks to do to work on and collect information. So let's talk about that maybe at the next meeting. Like. Do we need a formal body? And then we could post them and invite people to the public, and we could have our own sad minutes without involving Pam and Chris. That's possible. Is that something you'd like to put on the agenda for the next meeting? OK. Chris, you note that in the request to con discuss the housing subcommittee. Johanna. Thanks, Doug. I know it's late. My question has to do with University Drive and just next steps on the process, because I feel like there is, you know, we're like talking about some of the details and we have to figure out those details, but I also feel like there's general consensus that this is a spot where we want, that we've identified where development could move forward and we shouldn't allow it to take longer than is necessary to move forward. And so I'm just, I'm curious, like, when can we get a first draft? When can we get a second draft? What's our process for finalizing? And do we have any kind of goal in terms of getting something to actually vote on? OK. I, I felt like that was kind of the, the kind of thing that Chris was saying, we want to keep talking about it. And can we do that in the regular meeting? So Chris. Yeah. Okay. Well, we need to do it relatively quickly because we're going to be absorbed by the design guidelines project that is looming. We're about to hire a consultant, and then that's going to be moving into high gear. So we would prefer to do that sooner rather than later. Um, we do have two upcoming meetings in December. One is December 6th, where we're going to be talking about the Jones Library, and I'm not sure how where you think we are with that we at least have to go through conditions and findings for that uh, project but there may be other things that you want to address as well um, and then on the 20th we're going to be talking about um, hickory ridge um, trails their handicap trails being proposed there um, that i i don't think is going to be very controversial but i think it's going to have a lot of public interest so you may get a lot of public comments and it's also a it's not a completely straightforward project it's going to take some explanation so i guess what i'm saying is it could take an hour and a half two hours to get through that and then do you want to tack on another hour to deal with this which we certainly could on the 20th if you were interested and then which topic would you choose to address would you go back to university drive or would you go to the neighborhood issue so um what's your feeling about how you'd like to deal with this bruce are you gonna offer an answer to that question or yes go ahead i think i am i'm gonna um i was gonna say that um i'm somewhat practiced in in getting to yes through consensus process, having lived in a co-housing community for 30 years and five years before that, making it happen. Um, so I was thinking that a next step here would be to identify, as Johanna says, there are 
there's a, there seems to me, I agree with you, Johan, that there seems to be a number of things here where I sense that there was general agreement on. And uh, and so what I could offer, if, if it would be helpful, would be to go through this list and write down those items on the list there. We seem to have consensus. And um, uh, and, and maybe that's a start. Just yeah, so and that you could send that to Chris, and, and, and then uh, then we could review that. Um, I mean, this was a bit hard to review tonight because going through all those items, and we, we had a pretty good discussion, but we didn't go through it systematically. But I think if we were to extract the items where we feel we do have consensus, and then it would leave a smaller pile that we would actually need to hash through a little further. So I would offer to do that if that would be helpful. Okay. All right. For the 20th. December 20th. Okay. Or for next week. We could have it for next week if you could do it. Yeah, if, if he wants to bring, at least offer it for initial look next week. Oh, I could put it, we could put it on the agenda. And then if we get to it, we get to it. If not, we, we don't. We follow. carry it over to the 20th. How's that? Yeah, yeah, otherwise you forget what you're doing. Okay, so we'll put it on the December 6th agenda to discuss, to continue discussion of the um, University Drive Overlay District, okay? Right. Okay. Speak now or wait a week. All right, the time is 8.34. We are adjourned.